uh, one serving of fries has equivalent, a five ounce serving, like a large fries from McDonald's, has the equivalent toxicity to smoking an entire pack of tobacco cigarettes. So what they do is they make it impossible for our cells to manage energy, right? This is a state of cellular imbalance called oxidative stress. And what happens is free radicals will form. They will form in your mitochondria. What are free radicals? They are high energy particles that fly around inside our cells and they kind of tear through our cellular membranes and they tear through our DNA and they are damaging just in the same way as radiation. When I lived in Kauai, Hawaii, it was a whole different world there because people had grown up without electricity. They were self-sufficient. And most of my patients had, who had, were born on the island that were in their 60s were healthier than people today in their 30s. This is the core truth that all life on earth must obey, right? So if someone's telling you something, ask this question. Is that something our ancestors could have eaten or could have done? You know, did our ancestors have vegetable oils? No. Yeah. Did they eat a lot of sugar? No, but they ate some. Mm -hmm. Right? So so we can have some sugar. Did they eat wheat and flour? Yes, but they ate it fresh. They ground yeah. it fresh that day. Dr. Keith Shanahan, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me to meet your audience and talk with you. Really excited you're here. Really appreciate you taking the time. I know my audiences are going to eat this information up. Um, great. You're, I love it. Literally, right? <laughs> Hopefully. <yeah. laughs> I hope they do. Yeah, you're you're very well known and uh, throughout the world as a leading physician and expert in nutrition, metabolic health. And what I find extra interesting, if you will, is the uh, science of aging. Love it. Your your book, uh, Deep Nutrition, and then the the other one that I just got uh, earlier this year, Dark Calories. I mean, I love how you advocate for return, let's say, to traditional dietary practices, like maybe you would would have done a hundred years ago, <laughs> rather yeah. than all the processed things now. You know, we got all these things like processed foods and vegetable and seed oils. And um, I just want to start off by, uh, can we get right into this talk about Please. seed oils? Because, <laughs> you know, the seed oil stuff, I I've been looking on a lot of packaging for, for a long time, but especially recently. Man, this stuff is everywhere. It's hard to escape. So you really have to be careful, right? And why is it so important we stay away from these things? Well, seed oils are actually the leading cause of age-related diseases. And that is such a simple thing to say. You almost might think I'm just exaggerating, but it is absolutely supported by all of the best science. And I have been uncovering different pieces of science for over 20 years that all point to seed oils do this thing to us that brings about disease. And it, it's uh, it's it's at the level of the cell. Like that's where uh, all the money is in terms of understanding how, how any food affects us. But that's where the money is, in t especially in terms of understanding how these harmful seed oils affect us. It's at that level of the cell because that's where aging begins. I mean, age-related diseases begin. Sure. You know, you maybe have had people on to say this before, but I, w I just want to say this. Back in the day, aging wasn't associated with diseases. Mm -hmm. It was just something we kind of slowed down. You know, we didn't have as much muscle mass. We'd get a lot of wrinkles, um, but we didn't lose our minds. We didn't have heart attacks. We didn't get liver disease. We certainly didn't gain weight. So, you know, like normal, healthy aging normal aging is healthy aging, I guess I should say, right? Like that's sure. kind of a revolutionary thing to say too, right? Yeah. Normal healthy is, normal aging is healthy. We just want to get to where we are normal, like human normal again. Yeah. But our idea of normal health has been ratcheted down. We've really lowered the bar on normal health. Like we've redefined health. 
in a very unhealthy way, right? Like we think it's just even wearing glasses. Like I'm wearing glasses right now. Um, that isn't normal. That's actually a, a disease state. I have a disease. It's called nearsightedness, right? And um, I had to have wisdom teeth pulled. These are things that have happened to the human species that have not happened to any other species. And we're not questioning it. We're not thinking about it holistically. We're not approaching it in a way that I think makes any sense. And that's why I've had to write so many books, starting with my first book, Deep Nutrition, where in that book, I really emphasized the miracle of like what normal aging can look like when we have been eating healthy foods and when our parents and grandparents ate healthy foods. So we've come so far from that, that we don't even know what normal health is supposed to be like, even for children anymore. We think it's normal for them to have peanut allergies and food allergies. Yeah, right. That's not normal. Yeah. No, that's not normal. Uh, I was just talking to somebody recently about that, that we're one of the few countries anywhere in the world where people have, there's a high prominence of peanut allergies. It's not supposed to be like that. So you prompt a whole bunch of uh, thoughts in my mind. For example, 50 years ago, I'm 63. When I was 13, I'm in eighth grade. It's like maybe one or two obese kids in the class or in the, high, in the school, a uh, few overweight. type. If you were diabetic, it was rare. 50 years okay. before that, if you were diabe diabetic, they're doing a case study on you. So the food supply has changed a lot. Our level of activity activity has changed for a multitude of reasons. And uh, it seems like a lot of the new norms, like even the measurements now, please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but things like what a normal A1C should be, if I'm correct, I think it's changed from what it used to be. And the new norm doesn't mean it's a good norm or blood sugar or all these other readings that we get that the old norm was optimal and the new norm is norm, but it's not optimal. And it's like we're adjusting. To be average, sick. right? We're average is so normal. Nor, um, sick is norm now, or diabetes is norm. It's not supposed to be normal. It's like we're grading health on a curve, but you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to have your health deteriorate and does everybody call it, you know, oh, well, actually, that's normal now. That's not how you want it. That's not what our public health authorities should be like settling for. So I've been advocating for actual ideal optimal health, which of course includes aging that is not painful. We're not supposed to have arthritis be, you know, slowing us down in a painful way, right? Our bones may not have as much cartilage on them, but, and we may just, like I said before, be slower, but we're not supposed to experience pain. And we're not even really supposed to slow down until, you know, our 80s. When I lived in Kauai, Hawaii, it was a whole different world there because people had grown up without electricity. They were self-sufficient. And most of my patients had, who had, were born on the island that were in their 60s were healthier than people today in their 30s, right? Yes, That's yes, a big yes. deal. They, they were working full-time manual labor jobs in their mid-60s, and then they would go home and make dinner for their grandchildren and babysit. It was unbelievable. They were like energizer bunnies. And that is normal. Like That's truly normal, right? It's not, it is certainly no longer average, but it used to be, and it should be, and it can be again if we, you know, we just need to start understanding what a truly healthy diet looks like. And that's why I wrote Dark Calories, because I really wanted to focus on the worst of the worst and try to make this right now extremely confusing and perhaps bewildering, overwhelming conversation as simple as possible so that people can make the first simplest change that will get them the most bang for their buck, and that is avoiding the seed oils. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. I like how you said that, too, because I think a lot of times if you uh, listen to different podcasts or you read different things in these books, some of them are like huge, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred pages. Not a bad thing, necessarily. They can be very, very confusing for some of us. Uh, it can be so much information, yet it all is pretty simple. So we're going to go to a break in a minute. But when we come back, I'd like to talk about a few things like the simple approach but to just break it down into some easy to follow steps. But I do want to also find out what's happening at the cellular level. How do you see things happening that are causing the aging process? And how do these seed oils and, you know, we have 
toxicity of various fats, you know, industrial fats. We have the hateful eight, right? Um, and, and all kinds of other things that are happening that are causing this aging process. So uh, thanks for listening, folks. We're going to be right back with Dr. Kate Shanahan, our special guest today, author of my the book I just got from her earlier about a few months ago was uh, called Dark Calories. I love it. So we'll be back after this short break. All right, Dr. Shanahan, interesting conversation. Let's talk more. Let's get into what's happening at the cellular level. How are oils, like the hateful eight, first of all, what are they? How are they causing the cells to age? Like, And I'm thinking things like mitochondria and all this other stuff. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the, the seed oils that we need to avoid, there are eight of them. That's why I call them the hateful eight. They are corn, canola, cotton seed, soy, sunflower, safflower, rice bran, and grape seed. And once you start looking for them, you're going to find them everywhere and including your favorite restaurants, unfortunately. Um, so it's not just the oils you cook with at home. Uh, most people, when they're not avoiding them, are getting about 30% of their total calories. It's it's actually the single most uh, largest, the single largest source of calories in the average person's diet is the combination of these eight oils. It's insane that, you know, it's insane that nobody's talking about this. It's insane that doctors don't talk about it. Dietitians don't talk about it. That's absolutely insane. But what's also insane is that we don't learn that these oils are harmful. In fact, we're taught that they're healthy. They lower your cholesterol. It has to be good for you. But that is actually all wrong. And that's why I call the book Dark Calories, because there's kind of a lot of evil things that have been going on behind the scenes that doctors and dietitians are absolutely unaware of that have um, caused our medical education to be uh, full of lies, unfortunately. There's no other way to put it. Uh, that sounds a little extreme, but that's what's going on. And what we don't learn is what I want to talk about next, which is how these oils destroy our cellular health. Mm -hmm. And so what they what they do is um, when they leave the factory, these the bottles of corn, canola, cotton seed, or if you're a restaurant, the tubs that you get that you're going to be cooking with and filling with your fryer, if you're filling your fryers with, um, they contain small amounts of toxins that were not in the seed, right? So these are products of the refining and the, the industrial refining, and that refining is a very harsh process, and it removes important nutrients that protect the oil. So it also um, creates some toxins. It oxidizes the fragile fats. These fragile fats are called polyunsaturates. They're sort of the opposite of saturates that are supposedly bad for us, but that's a myth. And so that's why I bring up these chemical terms because the chemistry is what we've doctors learn wrong. Um, so it's the, the polyunsaturates that actually can oxidize and then they form toxins in the bottle. So when we buy these organic canola oil or organic sunflower oil, um, any of the hateful eight oils, even if they're organic, they have toxins in them. Now, it's a small amount, and that's why it has kind of crept under the radar. And again, another reason why I call it dark, because these um, toxins have not been made, you know, brought out into the light of day. But it, it, even though it's a small amount, something really kind of terrifying happens as time goes by. You know, because the oils have had their antioxidants removed, um, any little bit of light or heat or exposure to oxygen causes the toxins to multiply. Like they multiply right there in the bottle. Oh, my gosh. So you just, you, you know, we can't see this happening. It's invisible oxidation, invisible toxin formation that um, that uh, only toxicologists with special specialized machinery can actually measure. but it, So it's happening even on the shelf, but it really takes off when we cook with it. And the more it gets cooked, like in fryers, when uh, you know we're pan frying something at home for like 30 minutes to, to create the crispy crust, uh, if we make fried chicken, or if we go out to eat and we eat something that's deep fried, like French fries or shrimp scampi, any of that deep fried stuff, that, that has been cooked continuously. And so many toxins have formed by the time 
it's served on your plate in a restaurant, any deep fried food is going to have the similar toxicity to smoking cigarettes, right? It's insane. For example, yeah. French fries, uh, French fries truly have been compared to cigarette smoke by a toxicologist. So that quote that I have, I, I quote him in the book, it's a direct quote from his published paper, which normally these papers are full of kind of like boring, you know, not boring, but it's like they downplay the danger of everything. It's understated. It has very technical terms. But um, this one doctor, Martin Grufeld from England, has been making this so many papers on this. I think he's getting frustrated. So he's starting to like make it more accessible. And his highly technical paper literally said uh, one serving of fries has equivalent a five ounce serving, like a large fries from McDonald's, has the equivalent toxicity to smoking an entire pack of tobacco cigarettes. Wow. I mean, that's really, because in your book, you talk about this. And in my notes, I've been writing notes on, I always write notes when I read. And when I saw that, it really just kind of blew my mind. And guess what else? I haven't had any deep fried stuff. <laughs> I mean, I knew it wasn't good. But if you compare that, that's major. Yeah, I mean, and we talk about, you want to talk about like how to accelerate the aging process. Well, there's nothing better than to eat deep fried food or anything that's been deep fried. Like a lot of folks don't realize that a lot of chips that you buy and snack foods that you buy, those are also fried, you know, they're fried, they're batch fried. So they have the same toxicity as the deep fryer foods, right? They're essentially deep fried. So, um, you know, this is like, I say this not to shame people. Oh, you've been eating, you know, it's like you've been smoking. You didn't even know you had a smoking habit. Um, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to b wake you up and shake you up. This is the reality. There's really no mystery why people are having such a hard time with, uh, you know, the aging process and why so many people need to take blood pressure medications or heart pills or they develop like prostate enlargement or start feeling like their memory isn't working right or serious kidney problems have to go on dialysis. When you realize that we've been since, you know, childhood consuming these things that are as toxic as cigarettes, but I think they're, you know, there's even worse than that. And I explain why in the book, Dark Calories, yeah. it's worse than a smoking habit. But just imagine being born and starting out life, giving your, your newborn cigarettes, right? That's what we're doing when we give them formula. There was a time when formula was made out of pure soy oil. Uh, they have improved the formula of infant formula. So there's a lot less, thank goodness, because there was a time where that formula was so highly toxic. Now it's just less, less toxic than it was. You know, that's uh, to me is just a mind blower because I was thinking as you're talking about this, I, I, I'm thinking about all the things that are out there. Uh, in restaurants especially, but even at home, if you have the wrong oils and you're cooking in them, and these toxins are multiplying, especially especially during the cooking process, that to me is, um, well, it's frightening, first of all. You know, I went to university here, um, it's about 10 years ago, I went through the uh, nutrition program, and, you know, sadly, even though it's a really expensive place, I couldn't have gone if I didn't have a scholarship and all that stuff. They're teaching the food pyramid and all this kind of stuff. It's just so upside down. I've learned more outside of school about nutrition than I did in school. In fact, what I learned in school is I didn't want to be a dietitian because <laughs> I probably should be. But you know what? We have to go to a break. So we're going to head out to a break. And when we come back, we'll talk more with Dr. Kate Shanahan author of Dark Calories and Deep Nutrition. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. All right, we're with Dr. Kate Shanahan. Super interesting conversation. I love your insights, love your books. You know, in my clinic here at Neuromotor Training, we do a lot with people who are experiencing uh, movement disorders, Parkinson's, um, all kinds of neurological issues, movement disorders, but also dementia, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's. 
So many people are coming in with this. It's rampant. It's everywhere. And it's not slowing down. Plus, you know, we do have a baby boomer population that's huge. But uh, basically what I want to get around to is seed oils and whatever else you want to chime in on regarding this. There is an impact on brain health. It's a negative impact on brain health. And I'm wondering, how is it that these things get in our system? What are they doing that causes so much trouble, let's say, with um, cognition, cognitive function, and the development of neurodegenerative diseases? So what they do is they make it impossible for our cells to manage energy, right? This is a state of cellular imbalance called oxidative stress. And what happens is free radicals will form. They will form in your mitochondria. What are free radicals? They are high energy particles that fly around inside our cells and they kind of tear through our cellular membranes and they tear through our DNA and they are damaging just in the same way as radiation, right? So um, these toxins that we eat, they make it impossible for our cells to control oxygen and then we get free radicals forming. Oxygen becomes more free radical, more of a source of free radicals than a source of energy. So our cells are in double trouble. They can't generate energy, and they now have all this free radicals flying around in their cells. Now, what does that do exactly? Well, it depends what kind of a cell, and it depends a little bit on your genetics, right? But it leads to all known disease. So I'm glad you brought up movement disorders. Did you know that Parkinson's disease is actually a result of oxidative stress? This is the cellular process that drives Parkinson's disease. Wow. It's it's also the cellular process that drives Alzheimer's. And we know some of the interesting details here, like that oxidation reactions in uh, Parkinson's disease and many other movement disorders that are related to Parkinson's, like pro progressive supranuclear palsy or anything oh. that's Parkinsonism. There's so many um, diseases like that, even essential tremor. What What's happening? Well, we know more about Parkinson's specifically. So in Parkinson's specifically, the oxidation reactions are causing um, important cellular proteins to malform, and it's basically burning them and forming little blobs of garbage inside the cell that is useless, toxic material that the cell cannot eliminate. And so um, Parkinson's disease um, has... Uh, and Lewy body dementia is very related. Um, they've got uh, oxidized proteins in there. So in Parkinson's, I think it's called alpha synuclein protein. Yeah. And in Lewy body dementia, it's called Lewy bodies. But what are these? These are oxidized proteins that oxidative stress that, you know, smoking can cause it, but your diet can cause it. They've damaged these proteins. And instead of being able to recycle worn out parts inside the cell, they build up like garbage, and it's that garbage inside the cell that the cell cannot remove. Um, it, it actually, we are familiar with this substance because it's very much like what builds up inside a filthy oven that needs cleaning. You know that sticky stuff; oh, you just yeah. can't remove it. It's ox. That's oxidized protein and fat, right? That's it's all just oxidized stuff from our food. Well, cell garbage is very similar. It's dark and sticky. And, um, you know, tau proteins that are people with Alzheimer's have or uh, people with um, uh, chronic brain injuries, traumatic brain injury, they develop these buildup of tau proteins in their brain. That is the same kind of a thing. It's oxidized dark blobs. It actually looks exactly like the dark oven material, just it's minute inside your cells. So just imagine sticky oven gunk building up inside your cells. They're not going to work right. right. And the amazing thing is that when you stop eating these toxic seed oils and you do follow a diet that helps your body recover from this horrible state um, that I call oxidative stress, that's the name for it, your cells can start to recover too. And your cells sure. can finally, they can stop producing this garbage and then they can start uh, working again. They can start functioning again. And people actually have significant recoveries even from serious diseases like multiple sclerosis, that's uh, probably maybe you've worked with people with that as well. Yeah, many who come in with PPMS or relapsing remitting, remitting, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so especially multiple sclerosis because like that is an immune system disorder from inflammation. So it's a little bit different processes driving that, but those are more amenable to recovery quicker. Like you can get some really major recoveries from that. I I mean, like not overnight, it's going to take months or years. You can get people out of wheelchairs. 100%. um, I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Terry Walls. I had her on a few months ago. In fact, she's coming on later this week, but, but you know, we oh have seen... Did you know that? She read Deep Nutrition. That's where she learned about the toxicity of seed oils. She read Deep Nutrition when it first came out in 2009. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, wow. Yeah, because back then she was on her way. She had gotten out of a wheelchair finally and starting to ride her bike, walk, jog a little, because she was wheelchair bound for you know, a while and, and went through a lot of traditional medical stuff. I didn't know that connection. Well, I'm going to tell her I, you said hi. <laughs> okay. Yeah, tell her I say hi. Yeah. She's she's yeah. really awesome. We love her. But but that's the thing is she was talking about this too. And we notice it here. I see more, uh, let's say, uh, recovery. But I see more progress um, more quickly in the multiple sclerosis population than I see. In fact, I see like going right into mar- mar- remission um, after a time. It takes, it's not overnight, but more than any other movement disorder or neurological condition, right? And so that is really unique. Like you said, I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, so that's why helping, you know, so I've been studying this for over 20 years and like I've teased out the root cause being oxidative stress. And that's given me a lot of insights and that help people practically understand what exactly can recover and what maybe is kind of lost forever and also what's the time frame, right? So just to give people a realistic idea of what to expect. And I actually, I do consult with people. So if people just want to check in with me and like, you know, because it's very hard to find doctors. I mean, I don't know anybody else who really understands this sort of these, all these different processes um, the way that I do. I haven't met anybody yet, um, you know, because I feel like I've been leading the conversation for 20 years. So, um, Well, I think so- you have, and I'm just going to jump in and say that I have like every book it seems like by everybody. And the reason you're here with me, besides you're very nice and said yes, is because I want you to come and share this because nobody else will share it like you do. I mean, you're the, you're the leader in the, of the pack here. Well, thank you for saying that. Yes. And, you know, why does that matter? Well, it, it, it because if you really want to know, you know, the health, um, that is where rubber meets road, you know, the best advice possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, so absolutely. I... So I so I um I do consult with folks around the country. Um and you can visit my website and you know, I call it um health counseling and I basically mm-hmm. call it helping folks understand the information in my books so that it doesn't um really meet the criteria of mm-hmm. medical care, which sure. you can't do across state lines. So that's important to know unless I'm in Florida. Well, let's um we're gonna go to break in a second, but your website, if I'm correct, it's drkate.com, right? That's correct. D R C A T E, drkate.com. Go check that out, folks. And we're going to come back for another segment with Dr. H. Shanahan. Very interesting stuff. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. And uh, we're with Dr. Kate Shanahan today. Um, Dr. Shanahan, we were talking on the break. I think it's. Uh, one of the things that would be very helpful to people, you know, some of this information is very overwhelming. There's so much like, oh my gosh, all this stuff is happening in my body. All I did is eat some fries, but, you know, but maybe I did it a lot and all these other things. And or I eat a blooming onion at the state fair every day. And, it, <laughs> you know, it'll kill me. But what can people do? What should they stay away from? Obviously, seed oils, deep fried things, but then maybe segue into, um, what can they do to try to clear out all this crap from their bodies and, and, and move forward and get healthier, make healthier like cells and mitochondria and all that? What can we do? Yeah, so uh, that is such an important question. And one of the things that like slows people down from ma- making any changes whatsoever, I think, is this feeling of overwhelm that comes from maybe conflicting ideologies or conflicting oh. experts, right? Yeah. Um, so that's why it's so important, you know, to say that I've been doing this for 20 something years. I've 
educated other experts like the the low carb and keto doctors and folks like Terry Walls. I've actually taught them about the harms of seed oils and taught them to understand how they are inflammatory and oxidative stress. Why does that matter? Because like this, I'm the source. And what that means that like I've paid attention to the right details. It's all about details, right? It's not that complicated. You just have to pay attention to the right details. And I've been doing that. And I haven't had to change the kind of advice that I've been giving in over 20 years. And it works. It works better than anything else. So um, that philosophy that I have is let's just pay attention to what really nature would guide us to, right? Mm -hmm. Let's respect the wisdom of our ancestors who, by the way, did not have any of these aging-related disorders, as I was mentioning at the beginning of the hour here, where my patients in Hawaii who grew up, you know, eating pork fat and um, lots of uh, lots of fatty foods. That, there was a wild pigs on the island, so a lot of folks ate pork. And addition, you think of Hawaii and you think of fish, but you know they hunted a lot of those pigs. They raised goats. They raised cattle. There was a lot of your standard animal fats, right? And they were unbelievably healthy. And this is just common sense. Like, how did people ever used to feed ourselves? If we couldn't have eaten animals, right? We if we raised animals. That's what grazes grass. That's what eats like leaves. The things that grow on the ground, we can't eat, you know, ranch land, but cattle can, right? And so common sense tells you that um, animals were part of a human diet for a long time. And the reason it got confusing is because there was a point in history where this lie was created about cholesterol and animal fat that came Thank from you. the American Heart Association. I was hoping you'd say that. Thank you. Please continue. And it's important to understand that it was a lie. Like we had been lied to. So that's why you hear most people saying butter is unhealthy, eggs are unhealthy, you shouldn't eat a steak, a steak is a heart attack on a plate. You, you know, like people feel guilty for enjoying a burger, right? People feel guilty about that because they are told that it is so unhealthy. But that all comes from this lie about um, cholesterol, because all animal foods have cholesterol and the plant oils do not. And so that's why we ate them. It's because we were lied to. And I tell the story of how that lie came about, why it got adopted by um, medical doctors and why it was built into medical education. It's a long story. We don't have time to go into it. But I, I want the purpose of doing all that is to help like people see the certainty. Now, a lot of people resonate with the idea that nature is pretty amazing and, you know, it, our natural tendencies and our natural drives and inclinations are not evil. They're not like unholy or unnatural. They are natural. And so if we like steak, if we like things that are salty, if we like, you know, eggs and eggs feel satiating and cheese is delicious, that is for a reason. It means it's full of nutrition. And so just getting people to where they understand my core belief, my belief system um, is that nature is very smart. And we, when we ignore what our ancestors did because they worked with nature, they didn't have dietitians, they didn't have the American Heart Association telling to worry about cholesterol. When we ignore what our ancestors did, you know, people 100 years ago, the people who founded this country, they were all farmers, by the way, mm -hmm. even, you know, yep. the presidents, they were also gentlemen farmers. Mm -hmm. um, they respected nature. They understood nature. They would never tell you not to eat animals. They knew animals were part of a normal landscape, whether they were wild or domestic. So just to get to the, like, get rid of the overwhelm, this is the core truth that all life on earth must obey, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone's telling you something, ask this question, is that something our ancestors could have eaten or could have done? You know, did our ancestors have vegetable oils? No. Yeah. Did they eat a lot of sugar? No, but they ate some, mm -hmm. right? So, so we can have some sugar. Did they eat wheat and flour? Yes, but they ate it fresh. They ground yeah. it fresh that day. It wasn't right. white flour. It was fresh ground, generally whole wheat. And that's very different, very, very different nutritionally than the stale stuff that we get. Um, so 
that's where you can answer some of these questions about, you know, some of the more bigger controversies, right? We've already touched about seed oil. They're all just toxic. Animal fat, that's all good. But a lot of people get very confused about carbohydrates and flours and sugars. And I say they're not toxic. We just don't want to, the way that we eat them now, we need to pay attention to those details, right? It's all about these details. How are they processed? If you're if you're getting um, sourdough bread from a bakery that grinds their wheat berries fresh every single day, that's a good bakery. Mm-hmm. Not only is it going to be the bread going to be better for you, you're going to be supporting a good business, right? So we want to we want to think about the big picture. Where does this fit into the big picture? And I think that mindset is key. Once you get the right mindset then you can be confident that you are doing the right things. And in the back of the book, I dedicate the last third of the book to all the very important practical action steps that yeah. you need to take because it's um, it, it, it's there's a hundred pages of information there. Yeah. It's not difficult stuff to do. Anybody can do it. Anybody can take an apple, slice it in half, spread peanut butter on that, have that with a glass of milk, right? Yeah. Put some raisins yeah. on it. Exactly. Ants, ants on a log. That was a fun thing to eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like, ants on a log, oh, yes. So good for you. It's good for you yeah. to have a glass of whole cow's milk, not mm-hmm. those oat milks that are completely processed garbage. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I would agree with you there. So as we come towards the end of this segment, first I want to tell people that uh, once this show is done airing in a couple of minutes, uh, go to carlsterling.net, that's Carl with a K, and look for the episode with Dr. Kate Shanahan, because we're going to go into just a few minutes of overtime. But before we do that, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shanahan, do you have any, let's say, takeaway message for people who are listening right now? Yeah, Besides, so- you need to buy her books, okay? Buy Dark Calories, <laughs> buy Deep Nutrition, go to drkate.com, that's D-R-C-A-T-E. It'll be in the description, but what's a takeaway you could give us? I think I I would say I would challenge people to say, like, once you start looking for these oils, you will find them everywhere. It might feel a little bit overwhelming. Just try it for two weeks. And in the back of the book, I give you a menu. I give you a shopping, you know, how to make a proper shopping list for getting these oils out of your life for just two weeks and see if you don't start to feel something better, something. And I teach you what to watch for, too, how your energy is going to improve, your brain function is going to improve. Um, your digestion is probably going to improve. You know, I mean, it may not be everything in everybody, but certainly um, something. Great, great. I love that. And yeah, the book is fantastic. Uh, That last uh, third, like you say, has all kinds of uh, action steps in there, things you can do, suggestions. So again, folks, go to carlsterling.net. That's Carl with a K. Look for the episode with Dr. Shanahan. We're going to go over time now for a few minutes. And thanks for listening. And Dr. Kate Shanahan, thanks so much for being with us. It's been so great speaking with you and being here. Yeah, and it goes, the time goes so fast. You know, radio minutes are the fastest. But thank you so much. And uh, drkate.com, go there, check it out. Thanks for listening to Your Health Matters. We'll see you again soon. All right, we're in overtime here with Dr. Kate Shanahan. Doctor, that was fun to talk about all this stuff and hear it right from you. I'm really, my mind is blown by a lot of things. I think, you know, as I talk with more and more people and learn more, it's almost unfathomable, if that's a word, that the lie is so big and so many have bought into it, including most of our medical society. You know, our doctors, and my son's an MD in uh, Greenville, South Carolina at the moment. He had one nutrition class ever, you know, and they don't... They, well, actually, he told me, and another another one uh, MD told me that the curriculum for medical school it had there's a lot of input from big pharma to write the medical school uh, curriculum. So, I mean, there you go. But what we, we've just been deceived so much as to what is actually good for us. And like you say, go back to you know, would my great grandmother have eaten any of this stuff? No, absolutely not. Yeah. No, I mean, they couldn't have, they couldn't have, they, why would they, right? It doesn't taste good. The seed oils have no flavor. Butter makes foods delicious. Mm-hmm. Olive oil makes foods delicious. 
Some of my other favorite oils are peanut and sesame. Oh my God, they are so good for us. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and you know, like things like salty food, like we're told not to use salt, but guess what? If you don't put salt on your salad or your vegetables, I'll, you know, then your kids won't eat, want to eat it a lot of times, right? Yeah. And so, like right. we're driving yeah. people towards junk food. Yeah. But you brought up like the lie and how doctors, um, uh, you know, have uh, been lied to. I would say that in a way, um, doctors are the source of the lie, but mo- not most doctors, only a very important medical organization that a lot of people don't realize is a private medical organization called the American Heart Association. Mm. So a lot of people think that's a government organization, but it's not. It's a group of private doctors and um, they actually uh, have been around for a hundred years now, but they really um, became big and powerful after they got millions of dollars from Procter and Gamble, who wanted their help making people buy their soy oil and their cottonseed oil. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right. So yeah, that, yeah. that's why I say doctors, in a way, are the source of the lie. And it's this, it's not all doctors, it's really cardiologists, and it's not cardiologists today. It's those who lived in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and who pushed this agenda to help support the product their benefactor wanted to sell, which is really sick and twisted. So it's the American Heart Association that came up with this theory that cholesterol causes heart disease, and they they started promoting it before there was, without any evidence, really. They, yeah. uh, and I talk about that in Dark Calories, how they started, like they, they pretended there was evidence. They used trumped up claims. They, um, uh, this one guy in particular named Ansel Keys, he just was willing to lie to people's faces mm-hmm. about how the cholesterol, how his studies were showing cholesterol was causing heart attacks. And he covered up information about smoking. And that just allowed the American Heart Association to create so much misinformation that was built into medical education that doctors have no clue was, you know, just to support the vegetable oil industry in the first place. Right. Right. So this is why, like, there is no um, people, at, you know, the top institutions, Harvard and Tufts and Stanford and Yale. It's why they don't accept these ideas that I've been trying to talk about for so long. They don't accept it because they're part of the problem. They're part of the the, the system that continues to benefit from these lies. They don't want to admit they were wrong. They don't want to admit like all the research that they they did was kind of fake news. They yeah. don't want to admit that. Yeah. So it's not it, that doctors are miseducated. It's that we are part of the problem. Mm-hmm. And you have to know more than your doctor about diet and nutrition and health. And that's the crazy part, which is why I've written more than probably 1,500, you know, 1,500 pages so far and that's all to help protect people from being harmed by the the healthcare industry. Yeah, yeah. It's um, you know the other thing that's frustrating to me um, is the amount of resistance out there from certain doctors or medical people to take this information and digest it and actually look at it as being you know this is the truth and and from society in general because everything's so easy now you know it's so easy to go buy food that's prepared for you already and you know got all kinds of weird ingredients and uh names you can't pronounce and this is so easy of course a lot of them are very palatable for a reason the scientists designed them so you can't stop eating them of course (laughs) right like doritos my favorite is Doritos. If you eat one, you have to eat all of them. That's why I can't have any or I'll eat all, you know? (laughs) Exactly. Now, one thing I have to say, though, and, um, you know, you can you can come back to me later and um, either thank me or tell me it didn't work. But once you avoid seed oils for, say, like a year, 
maybe two, maybe it takes two years. You can just eat one because you real you you realize that mm. um, you're it's not as good as your dinner. Mm. Like when when you use the same tactics that the food scientists use, there's just a few tactics tactics that they use to make those Doritos so good. You know, they're just using combination of spices, salt and fat and, um, and you know, a little bit of different macronutrients. You can do that at home. And you when you do and you're using real ingredients, it tastes actually better. And so I never thought I could be one of those people who I used to find. I had a roommate in um, college who used to say, like, she used to buy all this chocolate. And I was a sugar holic. Um, and like, just leave it in the kitchen where I, it was like torturing me. And mm-hmm. and she would like, I mean, of course, I would sneak some. And um, and she would say things like, well, you know, I don't really like it as much as I, you know, I'd rather have a steak, uh, another steak than than have dessert. And and I was like, you're a freak, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, and I was like, I will never be like that, you know. But now I am. And and she wasn't a freak. She was normal. I was the freak. My whole taste experience, my cravings had been mutated by the vegetable oils and all the um the vegetable oils. The the, the thing that that is so important that I discovered is that they change our cravings and they make us crave sugar or they make us crave, you know refined um, carbohydrates often. Some people crave sort of like the salty chips. Some people crave the sweet stuff. But that is because of what the seals are doing to our brain cells. The brain cells, it's our brain cells that regulate our cravings. And when they are damaged, we go after the fast calories, the sugar and the refined carbohydrates. We don't have normal appetite. We don't crave healthy food. We don't we don't seek out nutrition. We just seek out junk food. Sure. Well, I, first of all, I agree with you 100%. And you are right. You are right. Because for most of the things that I used to crave, I don't anymore. I don't, uh, at this point, I don't crave Doritos. Although if I eat one, I do want to eat more. There's no doubt. And <laughs> potato chips too. That's always been my thing since I was as far back as I can remember. So it's 58 years, maybe, whatever. I remember. Hey, potato chips. Oh my gosh, yes. But but so I'm kind of wondering then is, let's say, here's a question for you. Like we, I think about a lot about here with movement disorders and training people, let's say, to reduce fall risk. We're working neuroplasticity. We're trying to retrain some new pathways, develop them so that they can stay upright, you know, and move better and live a better quality of life, reduce fall risk and falls. Are we doing a neuroplastic thing at all if we're changing our cravings by eating different? Is that bringing connections or is it the just, is it something else or is it a combination? It's a combination. So we're changing the chemistry of our brain cells. Okay. When we we kind of like revive the normal chemistry of our brain cells, then we also reclaim that neuroplasticity, so they can start, so they can make new connections faster, right? It's not like we didn't have any neuroplasticity, but we lose some element of it when we when our brain cells aren't working right. So when you change your diet, you change your brain cells, then you change your con- you change your connections, you improve your ability to learn everything. And that includes balance. Wow. See, that's really, really cool. We were talking with somebody else the other day who talked about, um, you know, this high levels of visceral fat in relation to longevity, heart problems, balance. I had no idea there's any connection, but I, and, and I mean, he says there is, but when you look at it though, um, all this stuff, all this Everything is connected to everything else in the body. Like the body doesn't label anything. We label systems. We label parts. But it all works together in this miraculous way. And we can eat bad, really have a lot of problems, or we can eat good and have less problems probably, right? So 100%. the body responds that way. The, the body will respond if we can 
get past the point of uh, no return, if you will. The, the, the resistance to change, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, all in I, our I, head. Yeah. That's a mindset. That's a mindset. I, yes, it is. That's what I've been, I, I think of myself even more so recently. I'm thinking more and more. My visceral fat was a little bit high, and now it's back down. Of course, I think that was largely anxiety-driven and too much cortisol, maybe. Okay. I mean, depends on who you listen to. Uh, Robert Lustig will say uh, cortisol is a driver of visceral fat to a degree, and anxiety is a driver of stress, is a driver of cortisol production. Um, I'm not going to question that. But what I do know is that I'm being more mindful now. It's a mindset of, do I really want to eat this? Or can I have something else? Or maybe I think I'm hungry and I'm not, and I'm just bored or anxious. So I don't know what to do. Have a glass of water? Yeah, that usually solves a problem for me. Exactly. So that is exactly the advice that I give to people. Um, I say, you know, check yourself. Are you feeling like you have brain fog? Are you feeling like you have um, trouble concentrating? That's a sign that your brain is needing energy and you kind of need to feed it. But that isn't normal hunger. And the difference between that, that, that is actually what I call pathologic hunger, which is not normal. And oh, yeah. it's it's a craving. Your brain cells are in dire straits. They need energy. And you should not ex- ignore that kind of hunger. So I teach people how to tell the difference between that kind of dangerous hunger that you probably really shouldn't ignore. And when you do, guess what? Here, Carl, this is how it's all going to make sense to you, maybe. That's what drives cortisol for most for many people. Right? Obviously, emotional stress does too. But when our brain cells are having an energy crisis, that the brain cells will tell the adrenal glands, you know, go, right? This is a stress. You shoot out adrenaline, you shoot out cortisol, and that does start breaking down your muscle. Um, and it's very, very bad. That's what pathologic hunger does. Normal hunger doesn't do that. And normal hunger, you can say, you can ask yourself, maybe I'm just bored, right? And And then exactly what you do, just drink some water or chew some gum or distract yourself for five minutes and whatever kind of like minor grumbling you might have had in your stomach will go away. That's normal hunger. It just goes away and it's from your stomach. Yeah, or I wasn't hungry at all and I just right. have grumbling <laughs> and my brain just said, I want this flavor now. Right. Because <laughs> it, it could. It, it can not- be a real battle. I think really there's this just this old fashioned thing called commitment to just commit to change. And just absolutely. You know, yeah, I promise you, yeah. if you, I think at the beginning you were telling me that you were still kind of occasionally eating fries. So you will still get more benefit than you've already experienced. So that's why I say, I promise you, and, and you can tell me if I'm wrong in a couple of years that oh, no, I already know you're right. I you have, won't no have doubt. those. You, you, I, so I'm promising you that. It will be so much easier. Like you'll still have the thoughts, right? Because it looks like any addiction. This is a true addiction. These the food addictions we have. Oh, yeah. they, you'll still have the thoughts, but you'll be able to push it aside. Yeah. And so, as an example, you know, I'm that chocoholic that I I I would steal my um, roommate's candy to the point that she had, you know, one candy bar left, and I knew she had not eaten very many, so it was all on me. And I would do that because I was a candy holic. Um, and now my husband got some chocolate on sale like a while, like years ago. And I think he forgot about it. But I, I can live with chocolate. Yeah. And I never, never was there. And so that's what we get. Every once in a while, I'm like, boy, chocolate and peanut butter. Wow. But I'm just like, yeah, I'm not from, I don't really need that. And then it goes away. It's like nothing anymore. It's so much easier. Yeah, yeah. I, that, I love that. Yeah. Well, I really like that idea that we can change. First of all, we have to have a mindset and be committed and we have to do the work. Okay. So this takes discipline, but we will change and readapt over time. I mean, that that's why when I, I'm not tooting my horn, I was almost 300 pounds. I lost 70 pounds. That's what got me into this business 15 years ago, being drinking way too much, eating way too much, not moving enough. And so- Folks, if I can do it, trust me, anybody can do it. I I really, really believe anybody can do this if you want it bad enough. But then my cravings are down from what they used to be, except for a couple of things. 
But, uh, you know, I try to make them healthier these days. Like, oh, somebody just brought me some ghost peppers today. I love hot, 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 hot peppers. <laughs> I'm addicted to hot peppers and coffee for sure, no doubt. Oh, man, better than sugar, though. So Way better. <laughs> this has been a blast. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you very, very much. Well, it's been a pleasure, Carl. It's, it was great to meet you. Will you too? Let's do it again sometime. And do you have any more works happening, like book wise? Do you have anything in the works? I'm working on a course for folks that will help them. Um, it's really going to all be about the practical to help them make it, you know, even more practical than what's in the book is like going to have worksheets and exercises. So by the time you're done the course, you're going to have like your the skills to make shopping lists and um, that make you don't have to do like meal prep on a weekend or even anything like that to just make planning meals on the fly a lot easier. Oh, good. Yeah, that'd be handy too. Because sometimes that gets in the way, you know, grab something quick, but it's not good. Right. But if you have exactly. it already made, that's great. Well, folks, be, be sure to go to drkate.com. That's D-R-C-A-T-E.com. Check everything out. Buy her books. They're awesome. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. All right. We'll do it again sometime. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and I hope you have a great day.